quantum so. fluid dynamics theory presentation. Take three. <laughs> and action. We're going to eventually, after I do one uh, part that catches us up to where we currently are in physics or the state of affairs and intellectually for humanity, then we're going to introduce a new uh, way of conceiving things called quantum fluid dynamics, okay? Before we get to quantum fluid dynamics, we need to discuss quantum field theory. That's where we're currently at. So in physics today, our best explanation of reality assumes that ontologically the base level of reality is made up of only fields, okay? Just fields. And to be clear, it's not as scary as it sounds. Field is plural, yes, but it's not an infinite number of fields. It's a finite number of fields, very specifically stretched dimensionally and by magnitude to fit together in a way to produce our reality, okay? Artificially fit together to produce our reality, by which I'm not, I'm not putting it down, Field theory allows us to put together an infinite number of fields. You can put together any kind of field you want, stretch, and, and you know, add them and superimpose them. Quantum field theory picked a very specific set of fields, but in order to know how to stretch and squeeze and twist those fields together, it literally had to go out in the world and make measurements of the constants of nature. Okay? So all these stretchings of the fields, we measured only. We didn't derive, we didn't predict, we have no understanding for why they are that way. We just have a measurement for them being that way. And when we put that in as the parameters of quantum field theory, it works like a charm. It explains everything in physics, quantum mechanics, general relativity, chemistry, and all the way up on the fundamental levels. We have the complexity things and emergence things and consciousness that we still try to understand. But on the fundamental side of, of all of science, we get everything from quantum field theory right there. We just don't have an explanation for why it's that. Okay, so that's where we're at. These are the these make the entire list. It's not an infinite list. It's not a small list, but these are the stretching parameters of quantum field theory in dimensions and in scale, and they're all unique. These are all different numbers from each other. Without these field parameters, we don't get a representation of our world to come out. Okay, so they're inherently intrinsically interesting. They kind of get downplayed because nobody knows what to do with them. Nobody. I mean, there hasn't even been a proposal for how do we investigate these numbers. And I think a large part is because in our current way of thinking, most serious thinkers would be led to expect, as a first expectation, that there's no way those numbers could convey anything interesting to us. Why? Because they're in units of meters and seconds and kilograms and coulombs. And, right? They're all, these are units we made up. Right? Why would there be anything interesting? If you're measuring something in feet, you can measure it in meters. Why would the number itself intrinsically carry any value? So no one's been looking for any numbers here to be explained. They just know that there are how we stretch the fields. But I think, and I think very little people have even thought to look how do we explain those numbers? Because they don't know how. There's no step. Right? And mostly because of the dimensional uh, analysis. However, I should, I should throw in. There is one coherent system of dimensions in science. One. Why is it that system? I think there's some confusion there. People think it's random. Meters and seconds, for example, are defined as tied together. Okay? So if you think that meters are a random measure of distance, then once you have that random measure, I can throw in time, and it didn't add more randomness to your talking, right? To your description of reality. Because time is inherently, intrinsically, binded to space in our description. And so are the other three. Or the other three, yeah, so we get five total. These are just all the symbols that we're going to use. You also don't have to memorize them. They don't, you just have to get a feel for how many there are. And, and know that we know them very specifically. So these aren't random representations in quantum field theory. They are known as very specific actions, constant actions that present themselves in reality every time we look that way. It's there every time, no matter who looks, okay? And they all have very specific measures. So we know them to extreme precision. In fact, the numbers on this screen with the highest precision are the highest measured numbers in physics, in science, <laughs> okay? So this represents our highest level of precision of understanding of our reality, yet there's no story attached to it. Interesting, right? 
at least it should call interest. Let's this call interest to a couple of notions in here. There's two that are specifically different. They have no measure that they're attached to. No measure of any kind. They don't reference anything in space or time or charge or mass or temperature, right? They're dimensionless like pi. So this is a geometric representation we've known about for a long time and we know to extreme precision, this one's the fine structure constant, this is the gravitational coupling constant, that are somehow just showing up geometrically bounded. They're geometric relationships in nature for some reason that we have no idea why it's there and no idea what relationship it's telling us about. If it was pi, we would know what kind of relationship it's telling us about, but this number we don't know what kind of geometric form that represents. We just know that it's some sort of geometry that nature's picking out and we don't know why. Okay. The next simplest group of constants in this set are the ones that only have one dimension attached to them, one kind of measure. So they represent a measure of the simplest kind. The rest are combinations. They have more than one dimension that they rep represent, but those combinations are very specific. It is exactly meters over seconds exactly just meters over exactly seconds. So it's a dimensional reference and a slice of that dimensional reference. Okay. The other half of the constants, the masses, are known to this precision, some of them way less precise than others. And at the bottom, we have three that we don't have any measurement for currently. We do know that they're non-zero. So we know that there, need, there needs to be a number there, but we haven't measured them and we don't have a way to predict them. We don't know what they are at all. Well, you might say, well, then how can we get quantum field theory right? Because it's the least sensitive to those. That's why. Okay, That's also why we haven't been able to measure them yet, because we have to have the most accurate measurements to get it. So this is all we're actually missing in quantum field theory. If you were to be convinced, if logically convinced that you had a story that explained all of them, that story would mean it's the story that structures our reality. It would be the most valuable story you could have as a sentient being because being able to frame your reality in line with how it actually is, is a really good starting point, <laughs> which we've never had, right? No one's ever had that. Okay, so we're gonna keep these in mind as the parameters that really need to be explained, the things we're interested in. All the constants on the left have relationships that are known, defining known between them. So we know many relationships on the left side. So you could technically think of it of these as representing a smaller number of unique variables if you wanted it slightly smaller, okay? Um, but on the right side, there's only one relationship that's ever been noticed and almost entirely ignored as far as I can tell, okay? Because nobody knows what to interpret of it. What do you, what do you make of this? I think it's interesting, one, because it's the first relationship ever found connecting the matter particles at all. So if you're trying to figure out why they are what they are, you probably want to look at the only clue we have. <laughs> but this one's a very specifically interesting clue, okay? Why? Because first of all, it's extremely accurate, as accurate as we have measured today. So it was, this was claimed in 1881 and it's still true to our best precision, okay? But also, if we change it so that, this is where we had the, so mass of electron, we're just making square root squared. It's the same thing. To represent it easier, I can say that the top, I'm, I'm letting the square roots of the masses be the elemental in each here. So we have three different elementals, which is the sum of the squares divided by the square of the sums. Okay? And it's exactly equal to two-thirds as a surprise. Okay? I'm not saying I've given you a reason for this. We don't know why. Well, let's abstract this away to see kind of why it's such an interesting thing. If it didn't have anything to do with the masses of any of the fundamental particles, and we were just saying this is a mathematical relationship between three things. What are the limits of this relationship? We have, you could, you could name several kinds of relationships actually, but if you picked democratic and non-democratic limits, let's look at those. If all of these approached A, A, B, and C approach equally A, so now it's just A, A, and A over square root of A squared of A squared of A added together squared, what do we get? One-thirds. Right? Our democratic limit ends up being one-thirds. No matter what we put in for A, it doesn't matter as long as all of them are A. Okay, so I can put in one, you can put in any number. Now, the opposite of that, the non-democratic limit, if two of them are really small and one's gigantic, we approach, it's like putting in zero, zero, one, three-thirds, or one. 
So the equation itself structurally between its democratic and non-democratic limit represents a swing between one-thirds and three-thirds, and nature's exactly holding a balance in the middle. Okay, interesting. What does it mean? We don't know. That's where we're at. That's the end of our clues to make sense of the parameters of our reality. <laughs> Part two, we're going to now introduce a new structure for reality, a new stage. So instead of using Euclidean space, we're trying to remove all of that structure and instead fill it with a fluid that's made of a collection of spheres that are elastically interacting and, all, and it goes out to infinity. Okay? And when we have that structure, the interesting thing about that structure is it has internal boundary conditions. Um, Euclidean geometry doesn't have a well-defined internal boundary conditions. It has points that are very ill-defined. It has been a historical problem that we've all known about for a long time. But as we zoom into the grid, you can go to higher, higher resolution. I'm saying that eventually it's just resolved. Just that one little planar square resolves to a collection of spheres. Okay. When, let's let that play. When we're in a, a universe that we're constructing this way, it has structural um, balances that it maintains on its internal boundaries. It has them available to be used. It doesn't require that they're being used, right? It just has a structure in which things could be balanced. To understand why that matters, it turns out that there's one specific way to take any fluid out to infinity and divide it under action that closes a loop without requiring to go out to infinity. So it has to be a locally closed, doesn't go to infinity, action that breaks into different kinds of actions that collectively close a loop. And the simplest possible way to do this is for a fluid to twist and turn into this hyperbolic figure eight knot, which then divides the fluid, the entire domain of the fluid once this is balance is achieved, has been separated to an internal domain and an external domain. This sur surface we're seeing, by the way, has cutouts just so we can see inside. That's not part of the shape, okay? If you're on the outside walking along, you could walk in and zoom, go around the figure eight and come back out, but you would stay outside. You would never get to go to the volume inside the, the torus inside. There's no way there. This white boundary literally represents where no fluid goes. So the fluid of the whole domain now has separated to a small wrapped around internal action. So we have a localized um, center for it. And outside that has to balance exactly opposite. So all the fluid along this boundary is moving exactly perpendicular to the center. No fluid on the surface is moving in or out. So since everything is just the fluid, there is no motion inside or out of that boundary. All I want to do in our entire structure, so that you can see the overview of where we're going, I'm asking you to imagine this fluid is existing. And now we're imagining that we've rotated and twisted the fluid under this balance. Now we're just going to characterize each of the different scaled actions that are already in that balance, two of them which you can't see on the outside because they were the opposite external fluid actions. But once we've characterized those five actions, we now have a system that maintains itself under a certain divided balance eternally. And that system will turn out to perfectly match the boundary conditions we've measured in our reality. And those boundary conditions perfectly set all the constants of nature and the masses of the fundamental particles of matter to the precision of every single measurement, best of our, ever, of our measurement, okay? This huge claim, the first action, by the way, these two, two equations are identical mathematically. They're just two different ways of representing the same thing. Some people would prefer to see it in terms of just rotations, E rotations, or hyperbolic science. It depends on what you're familiar with. I'm going to stick with this style from here on out because it's shorter, but just to know there's beautiful other ways to represent the exact same equations. Like you could put an I here with sine and with I in the argument. Like it's very, it's worth playing with. But first, let me show you why you should care. <laughs> this internal figure eight, the smallest action of our total balance, character is characterized just by a hyperbolic split division. I should back up, is simplestly characterized by a split hyperbolic action that's under circular rotation. So if we're going to just generally, without reference to any scaling parameter, we haven't put any scale in, the, in our description, we're only referencing a geometric action. So the simplest action splits hyperbolically in a square way. So there's a hyperbolic sine action, hyperbolic sine action at 90 degrees to each other, splitting this action, as you can see, and rotating around. 
that balance point, the balance point that defines the, the internal external of that action right along this surface, externally expresses itself as an averaged over of the internal action. So it's all a smooth external representation of the internal twist and fold. So this external twist is just a rotation that externally expresses what's happening on the inside and maintaining itself. Note, at every action, there's an internal and external thing that's happening. The external one's always simpler than the internal one, but those two form a balanced line. That balanced line is where we're describing these things, so at each balanced line as we go out. All right, notice, once we form the internal action, all the other ones form two, okay? We haven't, we haven't talked about them yet, but the total action involved has to twist all the other five. So all five rotations go through this neck. Okay? I mean, once you've characterized really what's just happened in the neck, you've forced all the rest of the actions is my point. So, the number of derangements, the number of, of ways you have to rearrange the fluid under action, so everything has to be rearranged, um, so it's a derangement, is just exclamation point times the number of boundaries. Now, I've told you five. If you didn't know, you'd eventually figure it out from what we're doing, but n will always be five and the number of derangements for five boundaries is exactly 44, okay? We can solve for the value of this external rotation. Everything else is known. All right, there's our first internal characterization. Here's a complex representation, real and imaginary, of just the internal action of the hyperbolic figure eight, not twist, okay? You might note it's beautiful, <laughs> really beautiful, how it's dividing and folding the world up into eight different divisions, okay? It's really easy to parse what's happening here, but it's good to kind of get a sense for how this twisting folding action always comes in pairs that are inverted. We fold it up, we fold it down, we fold, everything is always inverted, and that's where the balance is coming from, okay? If I do the inverse complex plot of the same action, of the same equation, you get to see the consequence, the inverted consequence. So from the external point of view, what happens from this balance? And it's this. We fold it and pattern into 44 divisions. The domain, think of it as a flat sheet that you twisted just right and it made everything like that, right? Okay, so get to the second resolution, we first need to discuss that in a quantum fluid, since our starting point was say, let's just assume reality is built from a quantum fluid, the highest resolution will end up being one, one of those spheres. Or if you're talking about a two-dimensional balance, the highest resolution of that balance has to be one circle. In that world, the next available scale happens to be, because it's made up of only those circles, exactly seven circles. This is just a rule of how circles work, <laughs> okay? It's very simple and basic, but notice it's exact. It's not you know, 7.3 circles, it's exactly six circles surrounding one, and scale one has one, scale two has seven. So the break in scale symmetry, something we're not used to really thinking of as an inherent trait to keep track of. In our structure, there's an inherent break in scale symmetry. An action at one scale can be involved with one quanta. And that action now, when it spreads out to scale two, must be spread over seven. So that break in scale symmetry is very important to a quantum fluid. Okay, because that's characterizing how you change in scale as you go up. All right, <clears throat> so B will always be, in this presentation, 7. So we have an N is 5, B is 7. Those are the only two numbers you need to memorize. But remember what they reference. This references the break in scale symmetry between scale 1 and scale 2 in our quantum fluid. N, the red 5, represents the five different scales, the five different rotations that are called into action to balance that hyperbolic figure 8 knot into our fluid. Okay. So we've characterized the first one. The second one is just the next bigger action up, which you can see here. It's not this one, that's bigger. It's just this circle. Make it easier to see. Pull this off. That scale, okay? Part of the system already. What is it? Well, it's just coming from the action below, but it's being rotated. So it's the inverse, operationally rotated action, taking into account the scale, difference in scale for break and scale symmetry of the first, of the internal action. And it's external expression is a rotation of this next measure. Okay, I mean, we don't know what the number is, you'll plug in the computer and find out what is the, the value of this, but it has an external expression of a new rotation to make this balance. The number of hinges that this total pattern is occupying is exactly seven times five, 35 of the original hinges that the first thing made available. 
which means if it took them all up and closed them entirely, you have nine left, right? But I didn't say that it did close them all up. It's acting on them. It doesn't need to close against them entirely. So, but now we've divided the world into hinges that are partially closed and nine hinges that are totally open externally, right? Okay. The next action, uh, let me point out, we also have this fantastically beautiful characteristic in our geometry that the, the, cos, the hyperbolic cosine and sine relationship here with the log of our break and scale symmetry happens to both claim that this is, happens when our boundaries get squared and when they are perfectly hyperbolically factored. So the gamma function. So the bound, these are the same ends. So both of these conditions hold at the same time. The third scale, of course, is just the combination, but it's a different action than either of the fir first two, okay? But it's a joint action. Notice we got cosine here and hyperbolic cosine here, um, and another hyperbolic cosine here. There's two of them here, there's two of them here. And in here we have two hyperbolic sines, and here we have two hyperbolic sines. And then we have another cosine showing up. What would a cosine mean to us? It means you're talking about a balanced hyperbolic cyclical action, okay? There, there's a, a, a co hyperbolic sine action, and this one is a, a balanced circular action. So on this scale, we're putting together hyperbolic actions and circular actions under balance, but we're not closing everything. It's not that the story's over there. We're just making a balancing point in which we close a circle and we wrap in two different ways, notice. This one's a squared way and this one's not. So we have a splitting happening and a squaring happening. <laughs> I mean, just keep staring at it, it'll, it'll pop up here, but this one specifically also has a representation of rotation through the scales. Okay, so what I'm trying to help, hopefully eventually see, is that going out this way in my representation is logarithmic in scale. Okay, so I've, our, our picture gets shrunk to things you might not regularly recognize, but if you can see the construction of the picture, a lot of stuff's gonna come out of the map. <laughs> Okay, this scale, this boundary is the division boundary, right? The internal and external of our fluid, the actions that can't uh, communicate or get out to each other or into each other are right here. That means that outside of this, the total fluid actions that are balancing against this have to counter it, right? This is a balancing line, not a, so everything that's going here has to counter everything over there. So this action divides the external domain under inversion, right? Under, what do I mean by an inversion? Under its own inversion. So if you take this whole equation and put one over it, then you get the other uh, scale. So both of these scales are called into action by this one, okay? So the external domain is then fluid dynamically split into something that has an X action and a one over X action, always. It's really kind of beautiful construction. But when you have an X that must come with one over X, then the crossing scale at the middle of one will always be balanced. So I'm telling you, we now have a boundary condition here that's, hy that's mostly hyperbolic, it's also circular, right? A boundary condition that then inverts to give our outermost boundary condition, okay? It's an inversion of this one, but it, because both of those boundary conditions exist, they are maintaining a, a scale in the center of the external world, right, that is Euclidean, that has a Euclidean signature that's flat, because the scalings, the stretching parameters of everything at one where they cross have all gone to zero. Really interesting that it would be a balance. Let me point out, in Euclidean geometry, you don't have an excuse or story or explanation for why it's Euclidean, why it's have Euclidean signature. It's just the assumption we started with that. It was never explained. In ours, we didn't start with Euclidean at all. We started with a random collection of fluid. We put it under a certain balance. This balance divides the world such that it projects a constant stable scale that appears Euclidean, but only on that scale. Its external boundaries are not Euclidean. They're hyperbolic and circular, but they're certainly not Euclidean. <laughs> awesome, because we happen to live in a world on our scale that looks Euclidean. And we happen on a scale of, well, this one says a scale of one, but we haven't said anything about scales. So it's just some external scale of one. <laughs> okay, the last step of comprehension is to understand that the figure eight hyperbolic knot doesn't statically just stay in put while all this fluid falls in and stuff. It's maintaining this, it's able to do this because the boundary of it is twisting around like this against itself. 
right? So the boundary we've been imagining has been imagining that you could go with it as it was doing its action okay, so far. Now I want you to just let it be more fluid and it twists again. So the boundary is not a mystery magical boundary. It's one that's fluidly forming all the time. It's an intersection that maintains itself. Okay? But the intersection can travel just like two waves intersecting travels along. Okay? So this is what's untwisting on the scales externally. So the way it moves externally forms a torus knot. Okay, a torus knot has two scale expressions. They're bound together by rules, but there's two different sizes, two, two different circles in this, okay? So two different radii if you care about. <clears throat> All right, so the expressions for how those actions then balance, as the motion of it moves out, it creates a new balance line on the big one, a balance line on the small one, and those two different expressions of this action, of its motion, this one's perpendicular notice, exactly the same, just scaled differently. So that's like having a circle with a bigger circle outside of it. <laughs> okay, uh, are just these equations here. I, by the way, I switched this to hyperbolic cosines of log b. Yeah, I'll do that one. It is exactly 2n squared over b. It means we're putting our boundaries, we're double covering our boundaries and dividing it by our break and scale symmetry. Those two things are legitimately to every significant digit forever, exactly I de defined as the same, like mathematically beautiful, which collapses our equation. And if you're a mathematician, you might notice <laughs> we can collapse several of these parts, including the square root of the pi and all of those, down to just the Weierstrass constant. So the Weierstrass constant is the elliptic constant that takes three unit things of the same size as each other. So three unit things, but one of them interacts with another two-dimensional one. Okay, so this is a three-dimensional splitting parameter, so a geometric parameter, but this balance it codes is very specifically elliptic. Okay, all right, so these are equations, and even if you don't get any of the math, what I want you to see is that it's just characterizing the actions of the different five scales that are balancing this thing into existence, okay, in our, in our fluid that we're imagining. That's the total structure. Everything outside of that will look random in the fluid but nothing outside that's accessible by something composed of this division structure, right? Because you can't get past. <laughs> all right, that's all we need um, to know about our, our hypothetical universe, or the one we're creating in our mind, the full to the quantum fluid, in order to really find something interesting. First, let's look at the, I didn't talk at all about the, the external um, hinges being used, right? Let's talk about that. The first two, we just had 44, 35, Externally, you put them together, subtract, that's nine. But since it's external, we have to take the square root, find out what phase we're talking about, square it, we'll start with, let's start with zero phase, square it and double it. And in this case, what would you get? What would the number be? 44 minus 35, nine, square root three, plus zero is still three squared, nine times two is 18. So 18 hinges. So we're saying because of this arrangement, externally, there's now an 18 hinge pattern and we know what action is happening on those 18 hinges. When we change the phases only, what numbers would these two be? Still nine, or three minus one squared. Uh-huh. I'm gonna run them through, but I'm gonna get rid of, since they do the same thing, because they're the split division, they have the same power, the same action, of course. Let's just make it the sequence, zero through one. It's 44, 35, 18, 8, 32. That's the sequence that characterizes the division structure of our hyperbolic figure eight knot that forms in our quantum fluid. Part three, the actual measured bounds of our reality, which by the way, in every case were a surprise. We did not expect them because, well, you would expect if there's a minimum amount of time, what's it gonna be? Zero. <laughs> That makes sense as a, as a minimum. And if that were the minimum amount of time available, you would say, okay, there's no mystery. I don't need to even investigate this anymore. That's just what it should be. But we found that it's not. There's a minimum measure of time known as the Planck time. And it's not just a hypothetical theoretical thing. We know it to very significant accuracy, right? 5.391245 plus or minus 60 in the four five times 10 to the negative 44 seconds really, 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 really small, that anything that's not zero or bigger than zero needs to be explained. <laughs> really needs to be explained. That's a mystery that's unexpected, does not connect to current 
um, quantum field theory doesn't play a role in the current physics story at all. It's a mystery we've measured that no one has incorporated in any mainstream comprehension of anything as far as I know. All of these boundaries, the Planck time and the Planck length, are, are minimum cutoffs. The Planck charge, mass, and temperature are maximum cutoffs associated with those minimums that we've measured to be in our reality. And I don't mean with our current technology that's as far as we can go. I mean the constants of nature themselves put together logically require these cutoffs. And we have measured those to extreme accuracy. So these are the parameters we should be extremely interested in, right? But we have zero story for them right now. And frankly, I don't think anybody's had a guess. Where do you start? <laughs> when you see there's a minimum cutoff of time, What's the next step? <laughs> uh, why is it there? No one really has any idea. We barely know anything about time, right? Okay, here's where the magic comes in. Did you notice? <laughs> 44, 35, 18, 8, 32. In the power expressions of these division boundaries we've measured, these mysterious cutoffs to reality, it's the same sequence as the sequence we had in the structural balancing cutoffs of our quantum fluid. Let's go see if the if it's more than just the, the powers. Let's see if the numbers have anything to do with it. The Planck time. The first external rotation of our hyperbolic figure eight knots, right there at the figure eight, the external rotation value was 5.391258. <laughs> okay, that's exactly within our error bars. All right, what was its power expression? Its uh, number of hinges was 44. Okay, let's see if the next one, <laughs> the Planck length, has anything to do then with the next biggest expression of our balanced fluid. Well, the second external expression or ro of rotation had a magnitude of 1.616259, and it had 35 hinges of rotation. Interesting. <laughs> Let's move on to the, the next one, the third, which is the second rotation, because right, I put the first one as zero, sub zero, right? Um, is 1.875545967, and it had 18 hinges. The Planck mass, again, every single time within the error bars, within one sigma of our best measurement, right? That's Two sigma is acceptable, one sigma is we accept. <laughs> That's how we do it in science. No, let, let's remember, there's been no explanation for any of these so far. We have a pattern that's knocking them all down so far. Let's see how far it goes. The Planck temperature, again, 1.416786, and it had exactly 32 hinges, which is two to the N, or two to the five, a full double cover expression. Okay, all of the Planck constants that we've mysteriously measured to be in our reality, for no known reason, perfectly numerically line up as double cover expressions of hinges of those five external rotations. All of them to the accuracy of our best measurements so far. We found a pattern that maps five completely mysterious unknown things about our reality. What can we do exactly with that division structure? If we then carry further and say, well, if reality divides like that under the balance of the hyperbolic figure eight knot, then it has exactly a small slice and a bigger slice and a bigger slice and a bigger slice of things always occurring, right? There's five measures available in that universe. And in that universe, where these are our division boundaries, our structure of how we divide things, the relationships between those boundaries themselves characterize the allowed actions. Why? Because we're guaranteeing that the boundaries were under a certain very specific balance. That means when those interactions occur, it'll always be a certain way. That's what a balance means, right? The speed of light literally is the, the Planck length divided by the Planck time. One of the best constants of nature <laughs> is the simplest intersection between the first two boundaries of our balance. The fastest thing that can happen is the thing that happens between the two first things that divide reality.
<laughs> There's a lot of comprehension coming in here. The list will start falling together. Planck's constant, another perfect relationship just between those divisions. Gravitational constant, the Boltzmann constant, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, the magnetic constant, electric constant. I mean, even if you've never studied these constants before and don't really have a, a real understanding of how they characterize our reality, and if they were in a different number, things would go all wacky and probably would never be stabilizable. Even if you didn't know that already, isn't it interesting that the only thing we needed to do to return the number of this value is to know these balancing conditions and put them in this arrangement spherically. <laughs> That's Okay, there's a geometric arrangement that's stamped into reality being characterized by this equation and all the ones we've listed so far. And what are they characterizing? The actions of reality. The ones we've measured, literally. Like, okay, what else we got? The Coulomb's constant and the first radiation constant, the spectral radiance constant, the second radiation constant, <laughs> and the characteristic impedance constant. Before going any further, when we look at these five scaled action, smallest one down here, biggest one up here. But we know that between the, the first two, there's a break and scale symmetry of seven, right? Well, what on the outside, the furthest out out, this is the interior boundary, the action there where all the things get to, to expel themselves to. So if you try to twist things together, where would the orbit end up going around the equator, right? As, as things flew dynamically went out. Well, we're gonna split externally by characterizing the relationship between the Planck length and the Planck charge and the Planck mass and the Planck charge. So the Planck length and Planck charge, Planck mass and Planck charge. And this relationship itself now counters the split relationship at the bottom that's based on the structural break and scale symmetry. What do I mean? Well, this thing is, is the same. I just put the Planck charge square at the bottom. It's exactly equal to a double cover raised to negative seven. Remember in all of our Planck constants, there was a 2 n to a rotation, right? A to a certain number of hinges or power expression. Here, the structure themselves are calling out to be just, well, to make this more impressive, let's take the log base 10 of this. I'm saying the log base 10, because of the double cover here, of the Planck length, Planck mass over Planck charge squared, all numbers with different powers and completely different digits, okay? You wouldn't expect to end up being something that's a whole number. <laughs> But negative seven, okay? The break and scale symmetry has now inversely reared its head. It's making that a balance. Of course, it's inverted, but it needs to be. All right, the hyperbolic vortex equation. This is where, to get further on a list of the constants of nature, we need to explain the fine structure constant. In order to explain the fine structure constant, we need to define the geometric connection between the Planck mass and the Planck charge boundaries, okay? Planck mass and the Planck charge boundaries have to be hyperbolically connected. We know that in our system for sure. <laughs> so if we write down the basic equation for hyperbola, 1 over x plus x plus x cubed, I'm going to use je instead of x, acrylic letter. Um, now, I don't want just a hyperbola. I'm not trying to characterize just a hyperbola. I'm trying to characterize a balancing condition that maintains two circles hyperbolically. So to do this, I just need to transform this one with a 2 pi. And now we have three different parts that are in play together, but the left two parts have different, inverted different, re circular relationships with the third. Interesting, of course, this is a side note, we now have a thing whose two parts come with the external world structure of being inverted. That's convenient. And look, it's already with a two pi. Oh, we can do a lot with that. <laughs> All right, let's, to, let's set this geometric characterization. Notice we haven't picked a scale. We're just doing a, a general geometric characterization. Let's set the, it to its general action. This setup, this arrangement, this balance set up to set equal to its action. What's its action? Two twists, two 90 degrees this way and 90 degrees this way at the same time, right? Two perpendicular orthogonal twists around a zero boundary. This is an arc, which is going to be our Planck mass boundary. So we're stretching from Planck mass, seeing how the charge goes around, or seeing how the action moves around. This is one twist, e to the negative pi over two is like that. We're going to do another orthogonal twist. We put a second one up here. And our zero boundary is just the Planck mass boundary. 
the e to the negative pi over two is i to the i. So I didn't change that equation, I just changed how I represent it, because I think that's more beautiful and more suggestive of the geometry involved here. Really want to pay attention and see what's going on in that i to the i. But remember, it's just representing a twist. One e to, I to, I, e to the negative pi over two is i to the i. Think about why. <laughs> okay, so this hyperbolic equation, we're done with the equation, it characterizes in a unit sense. We're, we're using the unit hyperbolas in circles. We're not, we didn't put any weird stretching parameters and multiply things to a strange thing. We're just using circles and hyperbolas, okay? And, and making it so that its zero boundary is the Planck mass boundary and twisting around. Therefore, its solutions will completely characterize the way that things are divided up between the, the sections that are divided between the Planck and charge boundaries. The solutions, we put this into the, into the computer, okay, and ask what are the solutions here for our variable? Well, it has to have at least three, of course, because it's cubic here, but there's two real and two complex. It has four solutions made of six parts, right? Two of which are in the imaginary direction. And we know them with a lot of precision, <laughs> okay, just from this equation. Why would this matter at all? Well, you might already notice that we really care about characterizing a relationship between the Planck mass and Planck charge boundaries if they're fundamental boundaries of reality, right? If you didn't know that, you probably wouldn't care at all. But if you know that this is characterizing that, then these numbers, you would expect, should signify something about the structure of reality that has to do with charge and mass. I mean, after all, it did claim that this equation is going to characterize the connection between the charge and mass boundary. Well, if charge and mass are balances between, balance, balances between boundary divisions that are being maintained by another fundamental balance of reality, then this is telling you how those are divided up. Interesting. Let's see then. What can we do with it? Before we see what we can do with it, just stay on the math side. We take the four solutions, all four of them, two complex and two real, add them together, and we get zero. They're perfectly balanced around the center, okay? And you can graph that like this. Here's the four solutions. This is not at zero. It's slightly got some positive value. And these all perfectly balanced. Great, that's what we wanted. That's because we were defining this way thing to be a balanced vortex, right? Well, what instead of adding our solutions, we take the product. If we multiply all four solutions of our vortex together to see what other thing we get in combination, now we get two pi. And if we square them first, and then add them together, we get negative four pi. So I'm saying if we have a balancing condition that's guaranteeing a squaring, which I kind of think we said before we had, right, then two of these things squarely associated are gonna project a sphere, and they're gonna break that sphere up into sections of what? Well, that's characterized by the solutions, the, the actual values of those, right? And notice, this gives us the, the most beautiful and simple partition relationship there is between a summation and a product of the same operators. We only have a, a magnification of negative pi out there, between the sum and the product. Okay. This is why we really, really care. Defined structure constant itself is so central to a description that we're desperately needing of reality that we know it's fundamentally the, the character that we're missing about the electron. We know that. The, if you could answer what the fine structure constant is, then we would know what the electron is. Why? Because it's fundamentally setting its parameters, and we don't know why. So we, we don't know what geometry does that, but we just know it's being done, okay? Richard Feynman in 1985 gave a good sense for why the fine structure constant's a very valuable thing to focus on. Let me read this quote. There's a most profound and beautiful question associated with the observed coupling constant E, the amplitude for a real electron to admit or absorb a real photon. It's a simple number that has been experimentally determined to be close to 0 0.08542455. It has been a mystery ever since it was discovered, more than 50 years ago. And all good theoretical physicists put this number up on their wall and worry about it. Immediately, you'd like to know where this number for a coupling comes from. Is it related to pi or perhaps the base of natural logarithms? Nobody knows. It's one of the greatest damn mysteries of physics, a magic number that comes to us with no understanding by man. Until now. This is the value for the fine structure constant, a number that is on the list of the best ones we know in all of science. The value for the, second, the first solution of the vortex equation squared is
I'm claiming it's the value. <laughs> the, the finite structure constant is the first solution of vertex solution squared. And now that we have that, we can really tumble down the ladder. <laughs> that we're, we can fill all the rest of these in because first, the relationship between the two known radii of the electron. Have you ever wondered why the electron has two radii? Do you know what yeah. other shape has a two radii? Two radii. <laughs> the two relationship between the two radi or the two electron radii is exactly the first solution to the fourth power. Okay, and if we take the only charge boundary that has been divided into reality, we're calling it charge, but it's a it's a division of a certain size. So that, of that size, we now call charge. The only charge boundary we've got wrapped by the first solution of the vortex equation gives us exactly the electron charge. The giant mystery we wanted to figure out. What do I mean by exactly? Here's the value of the electron charge. Again, one of our best parameters known. And the value that those two, by the way, we calculated this, right? We know this now to any digit we want. It was only known before. So we have a calculated value for this and for this. This goes as another perfect match within the error bars of our best measurement. Of the electron's charge. If you don't know, there has never been an explanation for the electron's charge of any kind. Not even a small little baby start step one. No one has any idea why it has that value. And the only charge that we really care about in the world is really that value and that one. The Planck charge and the electron charge were really the only mysteries of charge. The rest of it fall, falls out almost immediately. <laughs> it's an exact representation now that we have it, now that we have the the Zhe one solution, or hyperbolic vortex solutions, we can fill in a few more of our constants. Notice that there's often a pi associated too. Okay. All right, now to get the rest, I need to now address the masses because all the rest of the white ones here have at least a, a fundamental relationship to those masses. It depends on that. So I can't answer them now until I get those. So to turn to that, we talk about the charge and mass arrangements. We already talked about how it's divided. We know the equation that does that. We know the internal structure of the hyperbolic figure eight knot. This isn't for me, just go look this up online. This is one of the ways you can define the hyperbolic figure eight knot's volume, that complement volume we showed you at the beginning. It's just a composite in the imaginary direction. We slice it as a composite dialog rhythmically of a flip, negative one thirds and positive two thirds, okay? Negative one thirds and tau to positive two thirds. This is the volume of the five figure eight knot is internally divided by that kind of internal structure, okay? Which means we're rotating one thirds action one way and two thirds action the other way against themselves, and that rotation continues to do something like this. That's what it means, okay? But they're not equal rotations, and that's why they're circling around. It's almost like a pivot point, okay? All right. The charge divisions of the fundamental particles of matter internally perfectly match that same division. Externally though, you either get no charge, because let's say you were at the boundary where the fluid is perfectly divided, charge means moving out and in. <laughs> so there's none of that on these division boundaries. But if you do get charge externally, it's always expressed in full. In full meaning, this scale of this representation has one set equal to the electron charge. And we know now what the electron geometrically represents. So these are the internal divisions that are formed by the same balance that explains this. <laughs> Beautiful. But that's not the most exciting part because everyone has an explanation for the charge divisions of matter. Everyone that's tried, right? Because you've only explained one third, negative one thirds plus two thirds and negative one and zeros. You can come up with lots of ways to do that. The real thing that no one's ever done, except for the coyote a little uh, hint, is find a way to explain the connection between the masses of the matter particles, right? There's no story there. All right, I'm gonna collapse this square root of A square root of B to squared, to get rid of the squares there, but you can see why I had squared, it's the same structure. The external torus, not the scale, but the external torus um, that describes how the hyperbolic figure eight knot is whirling around in the external domain, okay? It's tracing out that torus path, can be sliced geometrically three orthogonal ways at the same time. And I want one of them to go through um, exactly perpendicular to the axis, okay, right down in the middle. So you can already see that the, the axis one sliced this way, but the other two, they could kind of go any way you want. Once you pick one, then the other one's set, right? Well, yes, exactly this split division, I want to slice up in three ways. The first slice looks like this. 
need them to be orthogonal. The second slice is this, and the third slice is more like that. Okay? So we have two that are the same, one that's very different, but we know what they're representing now. And we will put this now back as our geometric characterization to see what this is saying. We're balancing with our first and second solution of the hyperbolic equation, the only real solutions, um, and using the two-thirds action from below, and this one's using the one-thirds action from below. From below means internally, the, in, the smallest scale action. We're using those to hyperbolically split and hyperbolically join our geometry. Notice I said our geometry, because we haven't again referenced the scale. We're just saying this action happens and all this world's in play against itself, but this balance is splitting, this balance is joining in perfect unison, right? They're tied together, so they have to be. As if this split join, split join, split join, notice it's splitting in two ways. It's splitting this way, splitting this way too at the same time, right? So this splitting and joining that's always been maintained slices up the world, so it's all twisting together, right? in three specific segments. This, this world, this, these actions. So we have three specific numbers we care about. This A is the same as that A, and B is the same as this B, from this behavior. The last bit was the outside of the, of the torus. The fluid now has to drag against its action and then close on the external boundary. And it closes, very simply, under inversion again, on E to three gamma. Three gamma, gamma is the Euler master running constant. I'm not going to go into that right now, but it's. I, I, someone asked me for a lecture on that one. <laughs> okay, the, the, phi, the alpha phi gamma constant here is the splitting coefficient. It's the actual bifurcation coefficient in math. The surprise is it is the same coefficient in nature, right? This is fantastic. And this mu down here is the non trivial zero of the logarithmic integral. This is the zero that binds zero, zero with another zero logarithmically. The only one that we have a math equation to do that for. <laughs> and I think you know pi, the Euler Mascheroni constant. Okay, and our external boundaries, the, the final action closes on. So we're done describing our whole characterization because we've finished. We have a first boundary and a last boundary of the action. Notice the action did not close on the external boundary of reality. It never does. That, that, by the time an action gets out there, it has to have died. At that boundary that we, that's what it means it's a cutoff out there right so the action that it dies on is this internal boundary great so we have a full balance exchange dividing things up into these three specific numbers and we understand the divisions of all those actions okay we know why it's doing that turns out those numbers are the mass of the electron and the mass of the proton and the neutron those numbers exactly characterize the geometric relationship binding the three most significant particles of matter in our reality. In fact, so significant that if you got rid of the rest, nobody would have noticed yet. <laughs> All the other things we've only found in particle accelerators, no one's found them in their real life, right? So it's so significant that these three are the only ones you really care about. But as a physicist or as an intellectual person, you still would want to explain. Since we have found those, we need to explain them too. And it turns out both of these equations, since they're kind of characterizing the same thing just in an inverted way, um, both of them characterize all the assignments of the matter particles. Actually, this one doesn't get the neutron. This one, all but neutron. <laughs> okay, let's start with seeing how exact. The ratios of the neutron to electron masses and the proton to electron masses are known with extreme precision. You're probably tired of me saying that, but this equation gives us these relative values for their relationships. That's quite a bit of precision. <laughs> Again, exact. What do I mean by entire, though? Well, because we don't have measurements to extreme precision for the rest, proton, neutron, electron, we knew the best, just the best out of all anything in science. But some of these we didn't know nearly as well. In fact, this reflection term, the last action term, only shows up at the seventh significant digit to none. So I'm going to cut it only because you couldn't check me on it anyways afterwards. But it's still there, okay? Just conceptually, it's still there. The same equation, I got rid of the reflection term just because we didn't need that kind of level of accuracy. But we're adding a phase to the equation now. This one's got zero phase, so it's still just two to the one, or two to the zero is one. Equation's the same, just add an attack phase, uh, phase to it. Now let's duplicate them with the other phases of plus one and minus one. And this one gets to have a double twist because it's double cover on top. It turns out that when we do this, we, we get the return of the exact, we get the half of the matter particles of nature. We get the geometric relationships that bind the 
matter value, the mass assignments, or half the matter particles of nature, just from changing phase. Not only did we get the most important ones right off the bat, if you just added a phase to them, you got half of reality. Now, the phases are, of course, external arrangement, right? Remember, phase spreads, and that means if you're spreading externally, you're going to be folding internally. So what happens if instead of phase, we just put folds? Well, then, and here's where the doubling happens, interesting. In this case, we get an inversion that captures the other half of matter particles with exact precision. All of this. <laughs> the furthest off of precision, by the way, was the, uh, the fine structure constant. It was like a two and a half sigma. All the rest of these are less than one. <laughs> okay, fantastic. We have folds internally and phases externally. They have the same base arrangement. And that gives us all of the fundamental mass values, okay, the relationships of the mass values. By, to what accuracy? Oops, a little slower, there we go. To, like I said, exact precision in every case, every single time. This one, of course, we don't have measurements for. Right? We don't have a measurement for any of the neutrinos. So we now, according to this arrangement, have a perfect relationship for them. So if you do find eventually two, I can tell you exactly what the third one is just from this equation. Okay, cool. Didn't have that before. Completes the entire pattern. I just think this is so beautiful. That was just from the first equation. This one, the bottom slice, right? But because we know that the bottom slice is connected to the top slice, so let's just check for our own sanity reasons that we can find the pattern there too. Let's do the same thing and take off the, the reflection term and just for the uh, accuracy reasons like before. And now we're going to take the inversions. This one's a squared relationship. Okay, let's invert it. And look, something might be familiar from the beginning. We see a structure of equation here. The inverse split the three over square roots of three. Well, that's only half. And it's not the same selection as before. Notice there's been a twist of the arrangement. The other half are the internal crossings that that arrangement made, right? Let me go back. Take the three halves, it's the one half, times by two thirds squared, times by three halves, the one half, we get two thirds. Just collapse it just for that. Then these are just co combinatorials of the two thirds, but notice uniquely that these two, the phase cancels out on the splitting, right? So I can just wipe out those terms if you want. This one is the Kyoto relation. It's what we started with. But now we have a story that connects it to the whole, right? and returns all of the values we cared about. This one's less impressive number-wise, but only because it tends to arrange things we know really well with things we know not so well. Not, not always, it's pretty well there, but the other one's not so good, but it's within our exact measurements in every case again. All right, so here we go. Our equations, we're getting a little bit familiar with them as just slices, right, um, of the exterior arrangements. And now that we have these mass arrangements, it's very, very easy, the mass of the electron over the mass of the Planck, the Planck mass, squared is the gravitational coupling constant. The Compton wavelength, Bohr electron radius, the classical electron radius, not just the relationship between the two, but their actual individual values are also now found. The Compton angular frequency, Bohr magneton, nuclear magneton, Rydberg constant, the Hartree energy, and the Schwinger magnetic induction. As you will have noticed, I hope, we have a lot of green on the board. We literally, from just characterizing a division structure that's balancing and maintaining a balancing of quantum fluid, we're able to signify to extreme precision all the constants of nature and the masses as representations of that balance. Of the way that balance has carved things up. It only carves it up certain ways. It maintains itself forever, so it continues to carve it up that same way. All the ways it's carved up, all the fundamental parameters of our reality are the ways that these five boundaries carve it up. Okay, technically I'm done. So that was the whole story, but just for fun, like we could go uh, with the bottom slice and the top two slices and tell the story from, from either one. We didn't need both, but we like to tell both. It turns out if you are confident in a, your story about derangements, then you should be able to translate it into a story of factorizations because derangements and factorizations are actually two sides of a coin in a way. Okay, so let's turn it around and say, let's characterize instead of terms of just derangements the whole way, the way things factor. By factor, what do we mean? Bob, what do we mean by factor? 
breaking to break a, <coughs> a number up into parts which when multiplied together yield the original exactly the, the ways we can break it up and maintain the balance so the if we're taking the four or sorry the five fundamental rotations of our hyperbolic figure eight dot balance zero through four and we add all those numbers together okay that's what this symbol means so just add them all you get a new number and you represent uh, replace it with this put that number into the gamma function which represents the hyperbolic balance well which will then return the hyperbolic balancing point of those combined five rotations if we set it equal to the inverse of its own action the gamma function's action the gamma function acting which is trying to tell you how a hyperbolic balance happens so the gamma function's hyperbolic balance is balanced when the inverse of the gamma function's action from zero to infinity is balanced against it so we want to ask on what boundary does this balance occur the inverse action of this action using these rotations in it though okay and what's the boundary it turns out that boundary is exactly the Planck mass this is so beautiful and we just this is completely independent the, the gamma function here itself is acting on the first on, on all five of the rotations that carve up the division structure of our reality to make the Planck mass boundary the balanced scale the zero scale the things that everything's the same on that side on that side so I'm at the middle I'm at zero right it's just the gamma function acting on those rotations is returning it no one knew that the gamma function had any consequence of such sort first of all <laughs> I'm just blown away because these numbers are just numbers there's no power in them right they were just numbers it didn't put the power in. it's not the Planck constants we added up it's the rotation number we added up so the total is around 10 ish okay and it returns 2.1 one seven ten to the negative eight as its scale right it, it's really awesome if we then want to know okay great we've, we've got this balancing action happen it's factoring simply here the factors that could be balanced with it would be its square factors or its quadruple factors but you if you're going to have other additional actions they must be balanced with the current factoring actions okay so let's ask for the squaring one now and we find really quickly that it returns the Planck charge boundary this thing factors elliptically <laughs> on the Planck chain charge boundary. Let's check the next, the one over Planck temperature boundary. That's the boundary, well, you know what boundary that is by now. And it gives a relationship between all the boundaries take away the figure eight hyperbolic knot under three halves action inverted this one. Okay, this is, I think this is fantastic. But what about the balance of the two inside, right? We're, we're adding all five and we've returned the balancing points of the three external ones. The two internal ones need to come from somewhere. But you can slice the gamma function up in two. It's Q and P regularized gamma functions. And these two slices, which are now two-dimensional, put together, when you add them together, go back to one. Okay, They always equal one. So the, it's a very specific way of slicing them up. If you take the derivatives of both of those and add them together, you get zero. So they have anti-derivatives, right? So this is a very simple, natural way to cut things up. But when we do it and we apply this internal division structure that's already in the gamma function and well known to the first two rotations, we get the Gleeskin constant or times by the Gleeskin constant is equal to one. The Gleeskin constant is the single cover in which the figure eight hyperbolic knot is a double cover of. The figure eight hyperbolic knot literally is. <laughs> so the first two rotations, one slice of the first to two internal rotations according to the gamma function gives us this boundary connection to the figure eight hyperbolic knot fantastic the p regularized gamma function gives us our break and scale symmetry over the phygamom bifurcation velocity to the fourth power remember the alpha phygamom constant this is the this is the delta phygamom constant and they come together <laughs> <laughs> they are a system you don't you know, if, if you don't need to measure both at the same time but if a system has one it has the other right here we go at the fundamental structure at the very bottom is our bifurcation velocity parameter okay the fastest thing can get out of the way of each other determines how fast they can split <laughs> it's a beautiful surprise I think what we can do from this then is then say that the gamma the regular gamma function of these three rotations put in that relationship is equal to the internal the, the p and q regularized gamma functions of the first two internal rotations as long as they're put in square root and square association with that 
with this eigenbaum constant. <laughs> All, okay, the, the gamma function is a beautiful function. We just used its P and Q regularized internal parts to balance against its regular parts using the five rotations of our boundaries. I mean, it is defining that. This is really, really, I mean, it's almost eerie. It's so cool, right? <laughs> All of this from this simple structure. Uh, mind you, I still need to make 3D animations of this so you can see the outside. And I want to see this in fluid action, not in a solid figure. But if you can imagine a little bit of that with me for now, that division structure that we're balancing into this fluid perfectly characterized everything we need. Right? And literally, the whole story has been told, and we didn't have to go on long, strange tangents to come back. It always came straight from just the way we're dividing things up in this way. And I should really stress, this figure eight hyperbolic knot is the simplest knot and knot theory. It's the only arithmetic knot that we know everything about like we know pi, right? This is the most beautiful one. It has the most possible den surgeries, 10. The most ways you could screw it up, like try to screw it, and it would turn into something else cool without completely going away. <laughs> okay, it's a very, very, very interesting knot just to number theorists, or to, to knot theorists, right, alone. Now we're interested in it for physical reasons because it represents the foundational structure of physical reality and can land the entire match, right, with all of our digits, all of our uh, measurements. <clears throat> okay, so our whole theory of everything, our whole division structure is only characterized by these simple equations. Maybe they're not familiar to you, but by simple I mean, surely you've seen at least in a movie where physicists are doing equations on the board. This is simple. <laughs> not only is it simple, all of these were derivable from this one. Once you know just the bottom one, the rest are implied. Therefore, just this equation, just that, which you can write in a few other beautiful ways too, by the way, identically, um, is saying that the very bottom of the universe is just a cinch. <laughs> or not just a cinch, it's a square cinch. <laughs> I kind of like that, but yeah, I think it's fantastically beautiful. We're just doing a hyperbolic and circular balancing array, right, of the simplest structure we know. There's all kinds of beautiful things to look at. Every, every equation I gave you is something you can zoom in and out on because it's a fractal. And some scales, it turns into fantastically strange, beautiful things. Okay, I did it. All right, Bob, let's see what your questions are. Cut. <laughs> okay. It's Q&A time. Bob, this was what Einstein, everybody was trying to do. It took a lot of energy, too. Yeah, it did.